It comes from John 15, verses 9 to 17. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because a servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may have love one for another. May I speak and may you hear in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, whenever you actually do the reading yourself and you've prepared to preach, as you read the reading, you've got another sermon coming up in your head. It's just the way it seems to happen. I'm going to try and stick to the original, though, because they're the words that God gave me for today. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And you are my friends if, I, if you do what I command you. Some years ago, there was a television advertisement. Have you noticed, it's easier sometimes to remember the advertisements than the programmes. It was trying to sell a certain sort of insurance by telling us that security was the most basic human instinct. To illustrate this, the advert featured the Great Wall of China, telling us, although it may actually not be true, that the only human structure that can be seen from space is the Great Wall of China. Truth is, it can't be seen from space. I'm really sorry. But it was telling us that. Why, what is the purpose of a wall? Well, walls mark territories and they provide security. The wall of your house shows the, the limit of your, your house structure, but it's also there to stop others getting in. It's to keep you warm in this country as well at the minute. It's a most basic human thing. We need walls to mark out our territory, as I say. And if you were to think back to 2016, it's how Donald Trump got himself elected. He promised to build a wall across an entire continent to keep out the these, this thing the others are something we need to be wary of. Always be wary when people start talking about people as something other than human. A need or a drain on resources. Because as soon as you hear that, you are hearing the words of hate. But Donald Trump promised this wall across the whole of America. It is a really basic human instinct to build walls but it's also a sign of failure. When we need to build a wall to keep somebody away or something out, we have ceased to act in love. Love has broken down and something else is happening. There are other great walls that have been built in the world. We have one up up north at Hadrian. His wall is a bit bit of a pathetic attempt when you look at it nowadays, but I'm sure it was better in its day. But then again, there are other walls. There's one in Gaza, around Jerusalem. 
around Israel. It failed a few weeks ago, under, under pre obviously under attack. But a war like that marks failure. Failure to negotiate, failure to treat other people as human beings. On either side, I'm not making any political statements. As, we, as though we remember those who died because of failure. That's what we do today. Failures that have ended in war. Last week, Ben told us very movingly of his family's story, of his sister. But that story is repeated thousands upon thousands of times in this nation today. We tend to think we have a very small army, and historically it is small at present. It's 70,000 people. That, are, that is 70,000 people that could at any point be suffering trauma of injury and pain and hurt. But if we were to go back just to the 50s and post-war period, the army still stood at a million men. If you were to go back to the Second World War and periods like that, my goodness me, millions were in our armed forces. And that generation didn't talk about the traumas that they suffered because they probably thought everybody suffered them. But they did. But what are the things we suffer today? What is the sort of wars that we suffer today? Most of our wars are no longer fought on the battlefield, is what I would say. Fake news, misinformation, hate speech. Yesterday we saw hate on the streets of London, not in the marches for Palestine, but in the English Defence League. What on earth are they defending if they think they can be violent towards our police and towards people that are just being, going about their own business? It is a form of war when lies are spread through our population so easily. And where should our allegiances lie? To which side of the wall, whatever that wall is, happen to stand? Or to those who care for peace so much that they're prepared to tear walls down? I remember in the 80s when I first was influenced by the peace movements and people used to talk about tearing walls down and I used to go away scratching my head because that is a violent act. Peace is just not something that is easy. I can't help remember though the Remembrance Day from 2020. Can you remember where you were in 2020 at Remembrance Day? Well, I can tell you where you weren't. You weren't at church. You were probably at home. We had been told we weren't allowed church services at that point. Perhaps for one of the few times in my life, or well, at least my recent life, I disobeyed. I stood outside the War Memorial at Lemsford. You wouldn't have recognised me, I had my robes on. I stood there and I went through the service, the words of peace and the prayers. And I wondered if peace was a thing that could be achieved on our own. I wondered if peace was a thing that could be achieved without a vision by the whole of society for peace. I wondered if we could have a vision that took us past warfare. I do not believe you can fight war to bring about peace. It's a contradiction in terms. I had come to believe, and I still do, that we have to look towards a world of collaboration, of working together. And even the word collaboration 
at times of war is seen as a pernicious and nasty word because it means talking to the enemy. But until we do talk to our enemies, there can be no peace. And today I stand here not alone, but I do wonder how peace can be achieved for Israel and for Palestine and for Lebanon, how peace can be found in Syria, how peace can be found in Ukraine and Russia, or in so many places, without talking to each other, without communication. I do not believe it can be. If we want to pray for peace, we need to pray for people to speak to each other. We need to pray for people to communicate with each other. And I say it with authority, the authority of Ireland and the Good Friday Agreement. It's not worked perfectly, no one would pretend it has. But all they did was kill each other, and we them, and them us, until there were people that spoke to each other across the divide. And it takes courage, and it's a hard thing to do, but it is the only way that peace can be achieved is by talking to each other. And in doing that, we have to honour the sacrifice of both sides. If you come to a British War Memorial in France, you will often find an area that's given over to German soldiers because there was nowhere else to bury them. They didn't have, initially, their own burial grounds. Some of them have been moved since, but war, war cemeteries are bizarre in that they often have the, the remains of the enemy soldier in because they were all just equal at that point. But how much better would it have been if they'd been equal in life and spoken to each other? Moving on. When someone is baptised into the household of the Christian church, a sign of cro the cross is made upon their forehead doesn't happen in all denominations I think it should it's a sign that we are committed to Christ as well as the, in the baptism we have the cross as well and this prayer in traditional churches is said by the congregation fight valiantly as a disciple of Christ against sin the world and the devil remain faithful to Christ to the end of your life. It's the modern version of the old prayer that read, do not be ashamed to confess the faith of Christ crucified and to fight under his banner. We use militaristic language for all sorts of things and sometimes it is appropriate and sometimes it's not. The image that's being used in the baptism comes from an old military image. Where colours were presented and laid before the altar. So we mark the colours on ourselves. The cross. And that way we live under the banner of Christ. But what is the banner of Christ to you? This could have been one of my conversation questions, couldn't it, at the beginning. What would you understand by the meaning of the word, the banner of Christ? What is the banner of Christ? Perhaps you could answer, what is the banner of Christ? What would your, sorry? The cross. We signed ourselves with the cross, the banner of the cross. But what does that banner mean? If it's the Messiah, okay. keep going, it's, it's good, it's good. There are no wrong answers, I don't think. But <laughs> it's the covering. It is the covering, thank you. It's the covering of Jesus. We are covered by him. We are under his banner. 
I don't know what you know of history, and I know there are people here that know history as well as me and probably better. But I know that when a regiment went into battle in the 18th century and before, the banner was the flag, the regimental flag. And men would die rather than let the regimental flag fall. They would stand there and fight to the end rather than let the flag be taken away. Because that was their identity. It was all important. And as Christians, we have to ask, is our identity that important that we would make that level of sacrifice? that we would stand there when everything else is fallen. It's a tough call. You see, there are peace we can make. I believe there are very few wars that couldn't be resolved. But there is a war that we cannot resolve on our own. And that is the war of good and evil. Because that is down to God. We can have a truce that silences guns. But it has to be the reconciliation that was worth dying for. Otherwise, what is the point? The God of Jesus Christ is a barrier breaker. He's a tombstone roller. He broke out of the tomb. He didn't stay in it. In Christ, those who are separated are brought together. Enemies can become friends. That is what the banner of Christ is about. Under the blood of Christ. Under the nature of Christ. Enemies can become friends. I have worked in churches and um, worshipped in churches where criminals or ex-criminals have worshipped alongside policemen where drug users have worshipped alongside those that they've robbed that is what the banner of Christ can do for us that is what being under Christ can do Heaven then is not human work, although it can be seen in the wounds of Christ. Have you ever thought that the wounds of Christ are when humanity tried to get rid of love? You see, you can't fight war and claim it's for love. It's not. It's nearly always for greed. In fact, I can't think of a single war that's been fought for love. They've all been caused by greed. That's not saying one side's right. You know, normally one side that's wronged more than the other. The wounds of Christ were the wounds of war. As humanity tried to get rid of love. If we want to know the truest human instinct, then we must look to Christ. Because he was fully human and fully God. He didn't bring alienation. He didn't bring walls that divide. Rather he brought forgiveness, not conquest. And when Christians have gone marching into the Middle East in the past on, on crusades and the rest of it, that's got nothing to do with Christianity. It's got a whole lot to do with politics. Christianity is about forgiveness. Christianity is about acceptance, being accepted and love. And I don't believe I can fight for those things. Our politicians tell us so often that they're Christians, or sometimes now that they're of other faiths. But none of them can ever tell me a justifiable reason for war. There isn't one. 
It may be that people have to defend themselves. I'm not saying that you don't. But I am saying nobody needs to start one. Every war begins with human greed and is continued by human failure. So as we gather today for the annual remembrance of those whose lives were lost in war, we can make this remembrance better by declaring our allegiance to God, the God who is revealed in Jesus Christ. Can we march under his banner, the banner that seeks to bring peace? When Jesus was on the cross, I never ever heard the words that said, I die for one and not another. I didn't hear that. Rather, I heard the words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We didn't know what we were doing, perhaps. And I think most of the time, we still don't know what we're doing. But we do know that peace is an achievable thing. And it is our duty to pray for peace. So in a few minutes time, when we have the silence, please don't have it in a nationalistic way in your mind. Please have it in a way that says we have failed, we repent of our failure, and we want to move forward under the banner of Christ the banner of forgiveness, a banner of wholeness, and the banner of peace. Amen. On this Remembrance Sunday, let us bring before the God of peace our prayers for the world, the church, and all God's people. Merciful God, we pray for peace in our hearts and homes, in our nations and our world. The peace which is your will, the peace which we so badly need. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. We remember today all those who have died in any kind of war throughout your world. Service personnel who perished in the horror of battle. Innocent people buried beneath the rubble. Men, women and children attacked in their villages. Today we remember especially those victims of the two world wars including those close to us or to our parents and grandparents. We remember those who came home with terrible injuries, both physical and psychological, and those whose loved ones never returned. Lord, in your mercy. Remembering the conflicts of the past and the sacrifices which were made, we pray for this world today, where war is still a grim reality. Lord, as we remember those who've lost their lives, help us to renew our fight against cruelty and injustice, against prejudice, tyranny and oppression. We cry out to you in the darkness of our divided world, let not the hope of men and women perish. Let not new clouds rain death upon the earth. Lord, hear our prayer for the multitudes in every country who do not want war and are ready to walk the path of peace. May their voice be heard and may they not lose heart. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, we pray for the leaders of the nations at this time. 
asking you to pour out your spirit of reconciliation on them. Give them a longing to bring freedom from fear and freedom from want for all peoples. Give strength and courage to those who bear heavy responsibilities for the peace of the world. We pray also for the Christian Church, called to witness to your love in this generation. May Christians work with all to break down the barriers which divide people. May those who profess one faith respect those who sincerely hold another faith and build a community where there is harmony and understanding. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful God, we pray for all who face difficulties in their personal lives, problems in their families, in their friendships, in their neighbourhoods, or in their workplace. Help them to be calm in times of uncertainty and patient with those around them. Show us when we can give help and support to others around us. And on this day of remembrance, our hearts and prayers go out to all who mourn the loss of those who have been loved. And we remember Colin today, Lord. And we give thanks for his life, his long life. We give thanks for the gifts that he used in your pur for your purposes and in your name. And in a moment of quiet, we lift to you all that he meant to each one of us. We pray for the wife, Linda, that he left behind and ask that you would be so close to her and that we as a church would know how to minister to her, when to be in contact and when to give her the space that she'll need. Give us that discernment. When we lose someone close, we feel that part of us dies as well, but part of them lives on in us. Give us strength and understanding to honour and cherish that gift. Help all those who are bereaved to find the same consolation that in the knowledge of your love they may honour the past by looking to the future. Lord, in your mercy. Finally, we pray for ourselves that we may all put our confidence in you. Lord, you know we are often filled with fear and foreboding. Give us courage and deepen our trust in you. You are the rock which nothing can shatter. On you, we can place the whole weight of our lives. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.